Good morning, and welcome to this Religious Education Association panel presentation and discussion. My name is Dr. Ann Streety Wimberly, and I will be the moderator. It is our pleasure and honor to share today's synopses of and further thoughts about chapters in the book entitled From Lament to Advocacy, Black Religious Education and Public Ministry. The book was published and released at the end of June of this year by Foundry Books in Nashville, Tennessee, and is available through Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and Cokesbury Books. Three religious education colleagues were general editors, including myself, Dr. Nathaniel West, and Dr. Annie Lockhart Gilroy. The panel today will include four of the six contributors to the volume who with the others are rightly described as remarkable conversation partners. They will include Dr. West, who is Assistant Professor of Christian Education at the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology of Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. Dr. Mary Young, the Director of Leadership Education at the Association of Theological Schools in Pittsburgh. Dr. Sarah Farmer, who is Assistant Professor of Practical Theology and Community Development in the School of Theology and Ministry at Indiana Wesleyan University in Marion, Indiana. And Dr. Cynthia Stewart, the Director of Experiential Learning for the Parkinson School of Health Science and Public Health at Loyola University in Chicago. Chapters in the book were also written by Dr. Joseph Crockett, Dr. Nancy Lynn Westfield, and Dr. Rochelle White. But before these esteemed colleagues share, I will make some introductory remarks that begin with a key question that resounded among the authors of the book. What is the role of religious education and religious educators in an era where repeatedly we see on the news stark realities of injustice and hear the names of human beings whose lives were violently snuffed out. The names of a few, for example, yet short of the many. Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Alton Sterling, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, members of the historic Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, Amadou Diallo, 12-year-old Tamer Rice, Eric Garner, Philando Castile. The question burned within us and it burns still. It sparked the need for answers that will be framed in a variety of ways by the panelists today. But in advance of their presentations, I want to highlight a shift in language that appears throughout the book. Clearly, the Black church is known for forthright attention to difficult, life-threatening and life-taking realities of Black people's lives at the hands of racial insensitivity and hatred. We know that there were leaders whose public theology and methods of advocacy stand as religious education models for us today. For example, the 20th century connections between education and justice of Nanny Burroughs and Mary McLeod Bethune are highlighted in the chapter by Rochelle White entitled Religious Education and the Public Role of the Sisters Keeper. Lynn Westfield in her chapter, Religious Education and Womanist Formation, Mothering and the Reinterpretation of Body Politics presents a womanist, justice-informed pedagogy evolving from the roles of black mothers, foremothers, aunties, and other mothers as teachers who served as presence, listener, problematizer, and evocateur of imagination and meaning making to confront the absurdity of the prevailing body politics that devalues black bodies and lead to young black girls and black women's self-affirmation and worth. We're also aware of the formation and embrace of the necessary language of liberation that undergirded a process of confronting and freeing us as Black people from harsh realities to our rightful experience of human wholeness and well being. 
But while this liberation language is not negated, there is a shift in language that moves from liberation to an emphasis on justice. It is a shift that Joseph Croppet places at the center of the critical pedagogy that emerges as well from an examination of the Black Lives Matter movement in his writing on religious education in response to Black Lives Matter, a case for critical pedagogy. The shift in language that appears throughout the book is a way of specifically targeting, of naming justice as the reality that embodies a necessary quality of life, holistic well being, the common good, and a public theological view of being in community based on the biblical mandate in Amos 5.24 to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. This justice centered language is meant to open new thoughts about and embrace of what Annie Lockhart Gilroy in her epilogue calls a counter curriculum or to use her words, a curriculum that counters society's curriculum by first calling it out for the lie that it is lamenting the messages we have internalized and then countering with public advocacy centered in religious education. The book makes clear that justice is the polar opposite of injustice and requires focused, determined attention to reverse injustices that are part of the real everyday lives of black people. They're stories that are laced with experiences of racial bias, negative attitudes, denigration, unjust policies, gaps in social services, economic health and public education insufficiencies, breaches in political efficacy, and unjust policies and practices in the criminal justice system and policing that all too often result in death. Importantly, it just doesn't happen. Processes and practices of advocacy must be explored, decided, reflected on, and implemented in order for justice to roll down. In short, the call is for a justice-infused public theological turn in religious education that gives attention to the numerous existing injustices and advocacy, which is social action in the public sphere that names injustices, demands change, and engages in action designed to make justice roll down. And yes, there is a need for lament. My particular perspective is that lament is essential for our eyes and hearts as religious educators to see and feel the pain of those who come to us for nurture and those we purposely reach out to within and most surely beyond churches while also tending to our own need for lament. Our attention to lamentation, which is the expression of grief, begins with our awareness that grief is real. Justice-informed pedagogies are needed that begin with clear awareness that grief happens. Pedagogies are needed that invite people's stories, that allow for calling the names of victims of violence, that allow for wailing, that encourage questions about faith amidst life traumas, that utilize songs and liturgy, and that link with and reflect on scripture. Such pedagogies take seriously that grief won't be contained or hidden. And I might add, that includes our own grief as religious educators and the importance of opportunities for our own lamentations. In fact, acknowledging others and our own grief and engaging in forms of lament are religious educational means of gaining necessary readiness to tackle the question, what's next? Doing so may in fact be considered a prerequisite to entering fully into the what's next. This includes discerning, 
deciding and setting forth kinds of justice informed advocacy directed religious education practices to which our panelists will now turn. Each panelist will present one after the other without further introduction, followed by discussion, questions, and answers after all have presented. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you, my colleagues today. The chapter that I wrote was Religious Educators as Public Ministry Leaders. And the, the purpose of this chapter was to discuss the role of the religious educator as a public theologian addressing social justice issues. Religious educators are used to being leaders in the traditional sense where they have influence and power to decide what's best for the congregants. However, I don't believe that is the best approach to engage the community. I believe that religious educators should seek to be a part of a team, not simply lead or dictate uh, to that team. So briefly, I want to discuss the practice of crescent leadership and two Afrocentric principles that support it, followed by a pedag pedagogical approach that I call prophetic inquiry. Uh, crescent leadership is a participatory leadership approach that uh, rejects the top-down leadership model. It recognizes that the persons on the ground or in the community have a wealth of resources to engage in the transformation of their communities. Community res uh, residents, activists, and leaders have experiences that religious educators can learn from. They have been marginalized and they have felt the consequences of policies and politics that don't represent or consider them. Crescent leadership recognizes that the community residents and activists are better suited to describe their concerns and the injustices they are being subjected to. And two Afrocentric strategies that undergird Crescent leadership are Ubuntu and Ujima. Is the essence of humanity. Bishop Desmond Tutu says, my humanity is inextricably bound up in yours. And incorporating the practice of Ubuntu will allow religious educators to connect with community members and residents via their humanity and not reduce them to a problem to be solved or define them by their current present condition of existence. Ubuntu as a practice will demand that people are treated with dignity and respect and allow for meaningful relationships to develop. Ujima is a Swahili word that stands for collective work and responsibility. This principle highlights the necessity of building and reinforcing family, community, and culture among African Americans and Africans throughout the world. There is a collective existence in which the problems of one are considered the problems of all, and everyone engages in bringing solutions to these problems. So Ubuntu and Ujima as principles that undergird the practice of, practice of oppressive leadership promote interconnected relationships, partnerships, and the whole community is responsible to engage in the essential change. This quest of leadership practice, which is supported by Ujima and Ubuntu, can be applied to a pedagogical approach that I label as prophetic inquiry. And this prophetic inquiry model is building off the appreciative inquiry uh, model. And there are five approaches to it. One is discovery. And in this phase, the religious educator invites individuals to share their stories, uh, share their problems, share their concerns, talk about the injustices that they have been experiencing. And this is done with uh, the religious caterer and others passing no judgment, but engaging in active listening and giving one's full attention to the speaker. This phase allows for all the participants to hear the perspectives of those who are facing the injustices and also to be clear about the various concerns that they have. The next phase is determination. 
is after hearing the issues in the discovery phase, participants in the determination phase will ascertain what they will decide to do with these with those issues. If they decide to move forward with those issues, they will also have some consideration about who will be impacted and how, what individuals will be impacted, what institutions may be impacted, and the depth and level of what that impact may be. They'll be able to name that so they'll have a full understanding of what that is prior to moving forward. The next phase is discernment. And in this approach, participants will explore their religious beliefs that guide their viewpoints, that guide their interests in the issue, and the decisions to address their identified issue. What they are doing is seeking to know what God is calling them to do and what God's words teaches them about advocacy and activism. This moves next to the decision phase. This is the approach in which a plan is formulated. Now that an identified issue has been made or identified issues, there will be a plan formulated around that particular issue about how to take action. The plan will, can include goals and stakeholders and specific steps that will be taken to address the identified need. And the final phase in this pedagogical approach is demonstration. And demonstration is basically just taking an action on what was agreed upon. And the caution in this particular phase as they move to begin to move to action is to be conscious of the fact that the action taken is not to bring prestige uh, to any individual or to any institution. It's not to increase the image of any individual or any institution. Nowadays, many clergy participate into what I call branding themselves. And so I would suggest that if anything is to be branded, it's the justice that is being brought to the injustice. And that, was the, that is the focus on bringing justice to an injustice. So this is a, a brief synopsis of uh, chapter two, Religious Educators as Public Ministry Leaders. And now we'll turn our attention to my colleague, Dr. Mary Young. Good morning. My chapter is entitled Religious Education and Communities of Learning and Practice, Inspiring Advocacy in Public Ministry. This chapter has grown out of a keen desire to explore the various ways communities of faith might in fact become communities of learning and action. We know that both historically and in our current era, the Black church continues to maintain that pivotal place of importance in the Black community. But as the nature of community is changing geographically, socially, and religiously, a relevant question is, will the church keep pace and how will it do it? How is the Black church being responsive to and collaborative with communities of social action that are not birthed from within our walls, but emerge from the pain, injustice, and righteous indignation experienced by activists who are tired of seeing physical, political, social, and economic havoc wreaked upon those who are most vulnerable? And in what ways might the church demonstrate advocacy in demanding justice and holding the perpetrators of injustice accountable? It is my belief that the role of religious education should equip people of faith to live their belief in the public square and to lock arms with those activists in the community who are about social activism and truth telling. You see now exploring the chapter, which provides a synopsis of the material for the chapter. I begin with a discussion of the nature of community, various types of community, the intersecting and fluid nature of communities, and the ways people navigate social structures in communities. Black leaders have always had to navigate social inequalities in communities. It has led to the formation of oppositional or community resistance movements. I posit that when one considers the historical role and current challenges of the Black church as a community of the faithful, we can use the phrases community of learning and community of practice interchangeably because that's what the church has done. 
in examining the ways that the Black church has been that kind of community, I mentioned some historical practices of justice, some pedagogical approaches to action and rules of relationship and engagement that govern learning and action. Drawing upon Chuck Foster's definition of the faith community as the primary context in which religious education takes place, I cite several sources that describe the historical uniqueness of the Black church and its practices of justice. Oh my, it began back in 1790, where Black churches have always been gathering places of learning and practice for every major movement directed toward uh, change for Black people. The Black community of faith has tangibly lived into those practices that serve justice, that embrace the disposed and the despised, that care for the lonely and the lost, and advocate for those who have no voice. Even prior to the civil rights movement, attention was given to these dehumanizing practices and ministers counted such practices with biblical passages that gave hope to the people and addressed these actions that were unjust in our communities. Through reflexive and discernment activity that modeled Prieri's conscientization, the Black community, Black faith community was educated and mobilized to participate in its own liberation. And much of that gave rise to the civil rights legislation. Before and into the 21st century, these historical practices of justice emerged both as inward approaches from within the church but also as approaches that were outside of the church. Let me name a few of the inwardly focused practices of religious education that were justice oriented. There were such programs as health awareness programs and drug abuse prevention programs, formation of Christian academies, all of which emerged from within the church to address injustices. There are also examples of religious educational activities beyond <clears throat> the Black church. You may be familiar with the One Church, One School program of the 1990s. And then there is Tavis Smiley's The Covenant with Black America that occurred in 2006. More recently, and Dr. Wembley spoke of this, as we think about the journey to the Black Lives Matter movement, two specific indications of injustice prompted more defined actions. The 2012 shooting of Trayvon Martin was one that allowed Kelly Brown Douglas to write about the stand your ground culture of white supremacy. And that movement sparked prophetic black voices to hold the nation accountable to its proclamation of exceptionalism in 2014. Of course, the Michael Brown shooting, Leah Gunning Francis led us in writing about the learning and acting community of young activists and clergy in Ferguson, Missouri, who sought out to affect change and have the Ferguson Police Department own the wrong that they had been done. Regarding pedagogical approaches to action, Sirik Lincoln and Lars Mamiya and their uh, well-known Black church in the African-American experience talk about the Black sacred cosmos as the place where the spiritual and the public converge in such a way uh, that our community begins to address injustice through reflection and action. So here I draw upon the work of Bell Hooks, Kawanza Kanjufu, and others who discuss the role of reflection in determining clear pedagogy for action. Noting that learning happens both in the process of educational preparedness but also in the action that, draw, that, that develops out of that educational preparedness. Finally, then there are predefined rules of relationship and engagement for communities of learning and practice. And I want to talk about two examples that are illustrations. Research suggests that in these communities, learners and leaders do three things. They share a common cause, they value the contributions of every voice and they construct a plan and action plan that reflects unified wisdom. We saw community-based examples with the killings of Martin and Brown. 
Here I mentioned two church-based examples, both of which focus on ensuring the voices of the young are heard in discerning the community's witness and action. You're familiar with Greenhouses of Hope, where Dory points to communities of learning and action that give intentional attention to vocations of young people. Dr. Ann Wimberley's writings about the village, the Black village, becomes the community's learning cocoon, where Black youth are inspired, encouraged, and empowered for action. Finally, my chapter concludes with a toolkit for forming a community of learning and action. It draws upon the tenets of cultural theory and Sandra Bonds' research of the beliefs, rituals, practices, stories, and symbols that provide meaning and impetus for resource mobilization in the Black church. Barnes identifies such things as prayer groups, songs, gospel music, preaching, scripture, and even collection of resources as powerful practices that determine how religious education can shape the Black church public witness. I suggest here four educational strategies that are a part of that toolkit. The first is that if communities of learning and practice are to be formed, they must be formed around an educational purpose rather than a group of people. Those communities must also pay attention to the shifts that are occurring in the roles of teachers and learners. Thirdly, the context is going to change. Religious education is shifting out of the four walls of the church and into the streets. We saw it both with the Ferguson incident and with the uh, Trayvon Martin incident. Communities of learning and practice will also need to realize that the content of religious education should focus on the quality of existence in this present world but not just that, also on the hope that is in the world to come. In the Black church, we certainly have always embraced a theology of hope that soon we will be done with the troubles of the world and go home to live with God. But until then, we must live and act in a prophetic teaching and preaching tradition of Old Testament prophets like Amos. Dr. Wimberly quoted it earlier, let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. I now pass the conversation to my next colleague. Good morning. The title of my chapter is Religious Education and Prison Ministry, where public theology and public pedagogy meet. As a religious educator who sees the prison as a site of learning, it was critical for me to think through what it means to be faithful to the task of ministry and theological reflection in the prison. This chapter sought in many ways to challenge the naivety of well-meaning people of faith who enter the prison as if they are the only ones offering something, while at the same time recognizing that as people of faith, we must know how to navigate issues related to the criminal justice system. Viewing religious education from the lens of public theology sheds light on what is organic for many scholars and teachers of color. Often, our educational aims as scholars of color are not privatized nor individualistic. Rather, our educational aims are communal they often focus on the well being and flourishing of all people. This, for me, is where public theology and pedagogy meet, right in the public square, where we are trying to make sense of our role as people of faith. In this sense, religious education is not just about information and formation, but about transformation of people and the world around us. So in this chapter, I discuss five core pedagogical practices that I think sit at the heart of education, ministry, criminal justice system, and public theology. As identified on the screen, these five pedagogical practices are unmasking, countering, discerning, 
and acting and reimagining. And then I explore a pedagogy of care as a counter to the penal pedagogy that is rooted in the American criminal justice system. And I don't think it's an accident that many theological schools in the last decade or so have become increasingly more engaged in the prison, either through conceptually based chaplaincy, educational initiatives, or other forms of ministry training. The criminal justice system has become a context for both ministry and theological reflection. Institutions are beginning to understand that ministers and lay leaders must know how to navigate issues related to the criminal justice system. Because of my work in the prison, I'm more interested in my role as a theological educator in equipping students who are theologically grounded yet practically oriented with the concrete skills necessary to see the complexities at work within the prison system and to be hopeful about how they can position themselves as change agents within that context. Now, when we begin to start to talk about the racial reckoning that is currently taking place in this nation, it would be foolish of us not to acknowledge the criminal justice system. The mass incarceration of black and brown bodies is nothing new. And when I begin to engage these five core pedagogical practices in this chapter, I am attempting to pay attention to how our criminal justice system, which is rooted in just deserts, retributive justice, contributes to the inequity we see in larger society, which has already been named by my colleagues. I contend that religious education must remain in dialogue with issues of public concern. The public I refer to is the process, policies, and practices of the criminal justice system. And as theologians engaged in the prison context, I see myself as engaged in a sort of performative knowledge where theory and action are bounded together. They are mutually informing. And so for me, what this means is I'm interested in how students, particularly those who are interested in doing criminal justice work, enter the prison, how students engage their surroundings, the types of questions students are asking when they're in this space, the type of pedagogical practices and skills they bring with them, the ways they are formed because of their engagement in the prison context, and ultimately how being in the prison context orients them toward transformation of the criminal justice system. And so these are some of the things that I'm kind of wrestling with in the chapter. And as I begin to talk about the core pedagogical commitments, these are the things that are kind of undergirding. And so the first uh, pedagogical commitment I talk about is unmasking injustice, particularly racial injustice. And I think that it's about naming that blackness is not just a social problem, that it's a moral and theological problem. And for me, it's naming the social cultural narratives that reinforce the idea that blackness is synonymous with evil and really helping students see that these narratives shape our interaction with people of color and particularly with people of color in the criminal justice system. Through a critical analysis of social conditions and policies, public theological religious education help unmask injustice in its various forms. The commitment to unmask invites a theologically grounded critical awareness of the injustices prevalent within the criminal justice system. And so those who engage in prison ministry must go with eyes wide open so that they do not internalize distorted ways of perceiving and interacting with incarcerated persons because it is possible to do prison ministry and be completely unconscious of what is going on in and around the world. And so prison ministry that sits at the intersection of religious education and public theology calls forth a consciousness where one participates in the system by having a conscious awareness of how that system actually works. And so unmasking is about decoding the prison in a way that reveals injustices that might be underlying the practices and policies that take place in the system. And then I also talk about countering. And in particular, I'm talking about countering what I'm saying is penal pedagogy, right? Penal pedagogy is characterized by a criminal justice system that enacts punishment based on strict adherence to just deserts retributive practices of punishment. And as a religious educator, we understand that how we carry out punishment matters, that punitive practices shape people's engagement with the world and that punishment is pedagogical, designed to teach people how they should or should not act. Punishment is intended to socialize or shape thoughts and behavior according to specific sociocultural norms. 
the structure, actions, and language of the criminal justice system teaches an implicit curriculum. In other words, whether we like it or not, punishment teaches people how to think about the world and their relationships to the world. When students enter the prison, I want them to ask the question, what does the way punishment that is practiced in our current criminal justice system teach men and women, boys and girls about their identity, about God, about justice, and about human value? I propose that there are many lessons penal pedagogies teach. One lesson, for instance, is on identity. The American criminal justice system teaches incarcerated persons that if you make a mistake, you are a mistake. It is reinforced through the collateral consequences upon release. Yes, even in the 21st century, social death is still the price to pay for dishonor and disorder in the face of the fathers of America. The next thing I talk about is discerning. And that's kind of what we do as religious educators, right? And as practical theologians, we go in and we ask, where is God? And this kind of asking about where is God is so important for our practice of lament, but it's also so important for how we understand hope. And so part of the chapter is kind of breaking down that assumption that we're bringing God with us. No, I found God when I went into the prison, right? And so I assume that God is not outside of the prison system, but actively working in the prison system. In other words, discerning God's activity and presence in the world makes God real. Prison is not an abstract site, but a real physical location with real physical people who are experiencing real suffering. Religious education tends to the real stuff of life. To pay attention to those in prison necessitates a responsiveness to the deep brokenness that exists in the world and to attend to the difficult questions that are raised within the context. And then next, I'm talking about enacting a public pedagogy of care within a prison. And, you know, I asked one of the women I taught in the prison um, when I was interviewing her, how can the faith community be helpful? And her response was this, stop preaching and hire somebody. Stop preaching and let somebody stay with you. Stop preaching and find somebody somewhere to stay. Stop preaching and donate some clothes you can't fit. Be a resource. And so this, this idea that the prison context affirms that care is not just something you feel, care is something you do. To care within the African-American context requires a deep attention to the communal need for survival and liberation. The need for survival and liberation is even more pervasive in the lives of those impacted by incarceration. Caring in prison ministry is not charity, nor is it unidirectional. Rather, prison ministry is the mutual interchange of lives being exchanged across the border. And it is the life on the border where a prophetic space is created for more humane living. To enact care in the context of the criminal justice system is to perform theology. And then lastly, I um, talked about this pedagogical idea of reimagining. And part of this is asking the question, what is a vision of flourishing life for incarcerated persons? Which means that we're going to have to broaden our scope um, to build more expansive and just communities requires our imagination to be more expansive, stretching to see incarceration as a process that actually begins before a person is ever incarcerated and remains with them upon release. And so it means extending the conversation to examine the root causes of imprisonment and create new institutions to adopt what Angela Davis calls strategies of um, decarceration. And just to say that imagination is an essential tool for building the world we have yet to dream. Who we are and what the world can be begins to take shape in our imagination, even before words, judgments, values, and beliefs are even formed. So cultivating imagination and helping to reimagine is really essential for the work uh, within the criminal justice system. And um, now I pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Cynthia Stewart. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, participate in this wonderful panel and to be able to have participated in this wonderful book that we all were able to put together. The chapter that I have in the book is called Religious Education for Making It Out of the Hood, Spiritual Retreat Encounters for Youth and Young Adult Resilience and Spiritual Formation. I was very interested in doing this because for over 15 years, I conducted spiritual retreats for a nonprofit organization in Chicago that made it a mandatory requirement that all students that participated in a scholarship program um, called ASP in the book, it was required that the students from their freshman till their senior year of high school 
All of these students had to participate in a spiritual retreat. I, as well as my colleagues, were um, the ones that facilitated these retreats for these students. All of the students went to Catholic high schools and the students had retreats at their Catholic high schools, but because they were part of this program, they had to do this retreat. The retreat came about from the priest who actually started um, this program back in the early 70s. The priest took it upon himself. He was working within the urban community and saw the plight of what was happening with a lot of the youth back in the 70s. And he saw what was happening, hearing from the youth about their environments for which they were living in. And he went on a retreat and actually said, this is something that I would like to implement in the program. So within my chapter, I am giving you a viewpoint of the voices from a lot of the youth um, that I spent time with. There are four youth within the book. I interviewed over a hundred of the youth for which I participated with them on their retreats. So four of the youth, I have two males and two females that I highlight in the book. So one of the things that is very central about the retreats for religious educators is that it is providing a space for youth to be able to give voice to the various things that is going on in their lives. This was very instrumental to me because growing up in one of the impoverished communities of Chicago, a community called Inglewood, one of the things that was central to me was I actually went on a retreat when I was in eighth grade that my priest actually had me to go to represent my parish. And that retreat was very formative for me as a 14 year old. It was within that retreat that I was able to give voice to what was happening um, in the surroundings within my household. I grew up in a single parent household, but that retreat allowed me to give voice to some things that I did not have the space to give voice in other spaces. For example, in school, I didn't have that space in order to be able to talk about some of the various things that I was dealing with. But the retreat actually allowed me that opportunity with other peers, other individuals of my age group that was similarly going through things that I didn't even realize um, until we all had that opportunity to share our stories. So within my chapter, I'm talking about the importance of spiritual retreats provides um, that opportunity for youth and for young adults to be able to have that safe space. And that's where it's what Dr. Westfield talks about concealed gatherings. It's that opportunity where you can come together and within whether it's 24 hours, whether it's 48 hours, you have that opportunity away from your environment to be able to open up and be able to share. One of the things that's very central about the retreats that I did was from freshman to senior year, there were themes for, it, for each retreat. So in the chapter, I give a short explanation of each one of the retreats. So for the freshmen, we all know what it's like to be 13, 14 years old, first time in high school, not really knowing what that transition is like. So the theme for that retreat is called, Who Am I? And the scriptural foundation is Jeremiah 29, 11. And in that retreat is 24 hours and it gives those youth the opportunity to begin to wrestle with the question of who am I? With youth that are living in impoverished communities, one thing that they do not have is that opportunity for some of them do not have that opportunity with who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is the central reason why I'm here on earth? So when you form a retreat around that theme of who am I and began to break down that scripture of Jeremiah 29, 11, and began to speak into the lives of those, of those youth about you have a purpose, you have a plan. One key thing that we did on that freshman retreat was we knew ahead of time the names of those youth and we gave those youth a name card and that name card gave them the meaning of their name. So for example, my name is Cynthia and my name means bringer of light. And once I found out that my name means bringer of light, that then expelled in me that that is my purpose. 
I am a light giver. I speak life into individuals. So that's one of the key things about the freshman retreat. And then when they come back a year later, when they're sophomores, the next theme is choices and consequences. We all know that as 15, 16 year olds, we are then taking, we're, we're moving further away from our, our parents. If anyone has teenagers, you can recognize and know that that's when teenagers are ready to move on and want to be able to make the decisions on their own. So that's, so the scripture for that is Romans 12, one through 12. And we talk to them about the choices and the consequences for the choices that you're making. So within that retreat, we help them to flesh out how are you making choices? And then also help them to think about what are the consequences behind those choices? And then when they come back for their junior retreat, the junior retreat is about family. And that's the scripture for that is 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight. And within that junior retreat, that's where we're then helping them to think about family because now they're in the process as a junior, as a 16, almost 17 year old, that now they are getting ready to transition from being within their family and then they're getting ready for college. So we talk about the importance of family. One key thing on that retreat is that we ask each parent to write a letter to their child. Within that letter, we ask them to only talk about the positive. And then not only the parents, but we also ask other individuals within their extended family, it might be their coach, it might be their teacher, to write a letter to these youth. On that junior retreat, we give those letters to the participants. And that is so transformative because it's there that they begin to see that they um, are loved, that, that they have a purpose, that individuals see them in a different light than what they expected. And it's very instrumental. One key thing is all of the ones that I interview still have those letters and they are 30 years old or 35 year olds and they still have those letters that they refer back to. So that's very key. The um, last retreat is the senior retreat and that one is uh, called Transitions and that's Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. That's when we are preparing them. That's the longest retreat that they have. It's a full weekend from a Friday to a Sunday. And that retreat is uh, about transitioning where we are preparing them to think about what do you need in order to go to college? We're giving you the tools. We have been building from freshman year to your senior year, um, the retreats that you have been going on. This is now the transitional period. So one of the key things at the end of my chapter is, as I mentioned, I give voice to four of the participants. One of the youth talked about the retreats and talked about it gave her the opportunity to experience God. She experienced God in a different way. A lot of these youth that were participants, some of them went to church, some of them did not. But this provided for them an opportunity to experience God. Another youth also talked about, well, they're, they're an adult, talked about the importance of being able to bond with their classmates. And it, it gave them the opportunity to be able to see other individuals and to know that they were not alone. It was an opportunity for them to share their stories. And as they were sharing their stories, they recognized that I'm not the only one that is dealing with a particular situation. Oh, my peer next to me is also dealing with a particular situation. So it's just an opportunity for them to be able to share their experiences and storytelling is very important within these retreats. It's an opportunity for them to share their stories with no judgment, to be able to talk about the various things. Many of the youth for which I spoke with on these retreats, a lot of them were able to talk about the environments for which they were living in. As we all know, Chicago is one of the places that is highlighted a lot in the news because of the violence and the various things that are taking place in Chicago in terms of the shooting and killings of black bodies. And one of the things that is really required for religious ed educators is to provide this space 
because our youth need this space to be able to talk about the various things that they're seeing on the streets of Chicago. And that's what's talked about in the book is the importance of religious educators providing that space for you to be able to talk about the various things that is going on in their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, each one of you for this powerful, powerful presentation of chapters in the book from Lament to Advocacy. Uh, we want to open now for a discussion and I'm going to invite first some discussion among the presenters. And my question is this, what did you hear today from one another that kind of stuck out for you, uh, that touched your heart, that raised a question, or that affirmed something for you. And as they share with one another, the same question is raised to those of you who are listening and who heard uh, the presentations. What stuck out for you? What touched you? What challenged you? What questions did it evoke uh, in you? So from our panelists, let's talk a little bit among ourselves. And you need to unmute yourselves. Dr. Wimberly, I think that we all address issues of otherness in various ways. Sarah's presentation about penal pedagogies and the ways that what we hear on the outside or what we are exposed to shape our own sense of identity and value and worth and as well our philosophy about certain systems and structures, I think was so informing. And we, so she advocated for a dismantling of these penal pedagogies. And then in Cynthia's presentation, the work that she's doing with the retreats with young girls is the flip side of that, where you have all of this positive reinforcement about who you are, how you are valued. And there is this intentionality, right, with feeding in the positive so that those young people, by the time they are at that senior retreat, they know who they are because the pedagogy has been so powerful, right? Because the, the positive reinforcement, the feedback about who you are is just so valuable. And I, I just have to say this, I am a child of the South. And for all of you who hear me talking, you know that I am because you can hear my Southern draw. But if when I was growing up, my parents told me that I could do anything in the world that I wanted to do. And throughout my childhood and into adulthood, for the most part, that has been the pedagogy that has informed, that has, that has been the, the teaching, the curriculum that has informed my life. Now, I have to be honest with you, when I was doing doctoral work, I got to a point where I wondered whether I could really do it. But by and large, my life has been influenced, right, by this positive feedback from supporting teaching and learning community. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing that, Mary, because it, the same thing touched me. But in terms of all of the presentations, what came through is the hope. And I think you're targeting it in the, in the midst of all of the injustice, amidst all of the things that are going on that, that make us want to say, how long, oh Lord, you know, there is hope that is given in each one of those presentations. And it moves from that statement. I think, Nate, you said, people are tired. They are. I'm tired. When I turn on the TV, I almost want to turn it off immediately because there's so much there that's so negative. But what I heard over and over and over again today, and of course, as I go back and reread and reread the chapters of the book, it really gives a pronouncement of hope. Someone else on the panel want to share something that stuck out for you before we turn it over now to those who are listening. And I, and I think the, the, the hope is present because 
what permeated what 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 seemed to permeate throughout all of the um, presentations and all of the chapters is that to be able to connect with people and look at them just as human beings, Ubuntu, that their humanity matters, not their condition of existence, not whatever they were labeled, but just being individuals matters. Because if you start there, then you can connect with people and help them move and be transformed in ways that will benefit them and their community. I mean, like, because I believe if you start there, then we get to the kind of hope that people need to be able to, to be transformed. And so that's what kind of, kind of stuck out with me is that we've got to be able to interact with people, looking at them and receiving them and inviting them just through their humanity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. One of the key things that stuck out that I think is central throughout the book is the church is not within four walls. And as you heard from all of us, we all have something that is outside of the church and that we're all about community and going out into the community. It was something that Sarah said that someone, she quoted from someone about stop preaching, stop preaching and do this. You got some clothes, go give some clothes to someone. That just was really instrumental that some, and, and I think that's what's foundational about the black church. And I talk about that in the chapter is, the, the Black church is, is, it still is foundational for us as African-Americans, but we all have seen in the midst of this pandemic that we are no longer in the church and that we had to think, church leaders had to reimagine what does church look like now? So now that means that I have to go outside of this building that we so was worshiping and be able to do ministry. And I think that was something that was foundational and a thread through the four of us, as well as the other authors within the book, is that the church is outside of a building and that we are called to go outside of a building and to touch the lives of those for whom are not coming into a church. And we have a generation that is not, they, they are not about going into a church building. We saw that with Ferguson. And I remember going to Ferguson and the youth pretty much said, you know, where, you know, we are doing this and we may not do this um, in the same manner that it was in the 60s. This is our way that we're going to do it. And, they, and we have a new generation that's coming up that is not all about being within four walls of a church. Yes. <clears throat> And really what it says is that we've got to be not simply leaders, but learners and open to seeing and doing things in a new way. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are. Here we are together as leaders and learners. Now let's turn it over to all of you leaders and learners who have been listening and joining us this morning. What stuck out for you? What questions were raised? What affirmations were given? Yes, Kathy. I loved the presentations. <laughs> I've got to finish reading the book. <laughs> but a question that comes up is you talk about, especially Mary, the intersectionality, communities of learning, communities of practice and things. Is, there, is it also important to have an intentional, I guess we'd say, intersectionality or pedagogy that goes between the, the wider community and the families. Because some of you talked about the community, some talked about the role of the family. Is there some effective, I guess, pedagogy or focus to bring that together? Or is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy. If I can just kind of jump in, I'm sure my colleagues will also jump in. When we think about the the Black community in particular, the threads of family are all interwoven so that when something happens, when there is, for instance, a crisis in the community, the crisis affects all aspects of the community and the family, the, 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 the family unit or the families are who make up the community so that so that to address an issue 
that is an issue for the community. If we take, if we take, for instance, the killing of black and brown bodies, the ministry that the faith community provides has to pay emphasis, not just on the incident itself, right? But what are the, what are the residual impacts of that particular action? How is the, how is the family affected? Black mothers are impacted by losses of children. And so what does that mean for how the family fares, whether or not the, the family is cared for in terms of resources? Was that person the, one of the primary breadwinners for the family? All of those things are part of the caring and nurturing and the religious education practices that need to be considered for Black faith communities. The family is interwoven into the community. The family is the community. So it is a given that that, that, that ministry has to impact the family. It extends to the family. I would agree. Just this idea around, I think Dr. Wimberly in her introduction, she said justice-infused pedagogy. I think inherently it's holistic, right? It's, it's always kind of looking at not just the incident, but but the things, the root and the structures that kind of cause the incident. And so even when I think about kind of this idea of reimagining prison ministry, prison ministry isn't just to the people that's inside, right? Prison ministry is also the families in the communities that are in, impacted by incarceration, the children of incarcerated people. And so even, and so those lines between who the community is and who the family is, is just always blurred, I think, within Black religious education and, and communities of uh, learning and, and communities of practice. Yeah, and from the spiritual retreat aspect, the families were included, as I mentioned, you know, the families were always interwoven into the aspects of the different retreats. Relationships were formed with the families in regards to after retreats were, were over with. There were times where, depending on what was discussed, that we may have had to get a family involved in various aspects of what was discussed on a retreat. But I, I, I highly agree with what Mary talked about. That's one central thing is within a community or within the Black community, whether you are a blood relative, there's within the Black community what's called extended family. Um, an extended family could be, you know, whoever that teacher is, that coach, that neighbor, there's that extended family. And that brings about the resilience of a lot of our youth is because of that extended family. I go with the notion that we all have made it where we are because of a person, not within our family, but an extended person within our family that pulled the purpose out of us. And, and a lot of times we all can recollect and, and think about who was that person? It could have been a teacher, it could have been a coach. So, so family, as Mary talked about, when we say family, that's just not a blood person. That's the extended family, if that answers your question, Kathy. And I just want to give just one example of something recently that just happened within my family. My cousin drowned two months ago in Lake Michigan. And one of the central things um, that was so key for us was that Second Baptist Church in Evanston, which is where my cousins go to church, they wrapped their arms around us four days as we waited at the lakefront for his body to surface. And they were so central in terms of bringing food, prayers. That was our extended family outside of our family. And that was something that kept us going throughout that and are continuing to go through that. So I just wanted to give that as, a, as an example of the black church, the black community that family is beyond just our blood family. Yes, Courtney, I think you're trying to get in and after Courtney, Nat Samuel. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the work that you've done for this volume. It makes such a, a big contribution to our field. I appreciate that. 
My question comes from um, actually using Dr. Wimberly's soul stories for many years, my intro to Christian education course. I assume that similar, similar questions might come up with students in using your volume. So I'm passing it along, which is, which is a question of appropriation. So in referencing, say, values like a family or Ubuntu, students wonder and worry about misappropriating what is part of the African-American tradition for their own communities. So what would you say to those students as an appropriate, a respectful, appropriate use of the wisdom that you bring? Nate, I don't know whether you want to answer that or if you want me to say something. I'll let you start. <laughs> okay, I'll begin. <laughs> Soul Stories was written from a Black perspective. So from that standpoint, it took a contextual, a cultural contextual approach to linking story with scripture and a, those who were forebears in the faith. However, by virtue of it being cultural contextual means that it can be transferable to other contexts. And that is to say, other cultural contexts may utilize that material and apply it to that particular context. Now, what you're saying really raises an important question that I was going to raise a little later on, and that is the question of, does what is presented in the book apply only to the Black church? Well, if we are in fact to be serious about moving from injustice to justice, it is the responsibility of all. And so whatever material appears there, whatever pedagogical models appear there must have some applicability, whoever we are, wherever we are. And we have to be able to use eyes and discernment to see, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to my church? How does this apply to my context, wherever I am? So if that is the case, then there's no question about appropriation. <laughs> In fact, we, we hope that when we look at it, we can learn something from the particular Black perspective that is there. But from that perspective, we say, ah, I see what's needed where I am. So that, that's how I, I would approach it. And, and I hopefully, hopefully that's the case because short of that, I don't think justice will prevail. We cannot exist as separate communities. We've got to come together. We've got to intersect. We've got to see through eyes of a whole community, not just one. It isn't up to just me. It's up to all of us. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and, and I would only add that, you know, for me, the question is not appropriation, it'd be misappropriation and taking the content or models that the intent is to use it in a ways that it wasn't conceived for. So I think that would be more, more of the question. And agreeing with Dr. Wimberly that Utilizing, you know, models and strategies that were conceived by Black authors is open to be used by, you know, other contexts. And the primary reason is because they may not have those kind of insights to be able to develop those kind of models and strategies. So therefore, they're open to use it in ways that would be uh, meaningful and apply to the context to uh, make sure they address the injustices too in those contexts. And also it helps to connect with partnership to be able to understand ways in which injustices can be um, addressed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Samuel. Hi, hello everyone. Um, thank you for really thought provoking presentations. I'm wondering whether any of the presenters or anyone else has thoughts on the use of lament in the classroom or in religious education spaces. I teach social justice and my graduate students right now are really struggling with what's going on 
and not just the weight of it all, but also the protracted nature of it, you know. And together we've been exploring the, the, the scriptural basis and also the basis in the black community of this crying out to God, you know, this lamenting and the way in which it helps us transition to, to carry our burdens better and to, and to have hope. So I'm just wondering whether anyone can speak to their experiences of either using lament in a pedagogical setting, you know, and, and how that has and, and how that has helped. I can um, say a little bit about that. I'm actually teaching a course right now called Hope and Suffering. And so um, one of the kind of practices we talk about is lament. And so we do, you know, of course, I lecture on what lament is. And I allow them to either write a personal lament or a communal lament. So then they actually get to practice kind of the structure for lament. Like lament is about movement, right? It moves us from this kind of really deep expression of sorrow and pain and complaint and kind of a, a reckoning with God toward kind of like a reassessment um, and a trusting God. But it was interesting because during that time, I work in the evangelical context. During that time, our students were actually protesting. And so what I did was I canceled my class that day. And I said, instead of, cause one of the students in our class was part of the protest. So I said, instead of coming to class today, we're all going to join the protest. And I told students that they felt uncomfortable because like I said, some students are still even in my context are grappling with this protest. Okay. But, you know, we did that. And then we kind of came back and we unpacked, you know, in what way does protest actually serve as a form of lament? And so part of what I'm, you know, because part of, I think this whole idea of lament is you got to break down people's kind of fear of questioning God or their fear that God is fragile, their, their kind of desire to kind of protect and defend God. And so, and so I was, you know, I've, I kind of incorporated that intentionally into my class to say, you know, we're talking about it, but what does it look like to practice it in a way where we're in solidarity? Like this is, this is a communal process where we're lamenting what's happening in the nation. So, and, and of course at our school. So I don't know if that's helpful. But. Yeah, I agree with Sarah. Classes that I've taught also a component of taking students outside of the classroom um, and into a community to hear the voices of those in various communities. So various different religious in institutions within the community and having them to hear from those in those various communities, those disenfranchised communities, and then using that as a space, as Dr. Wimberly talked about, teaching students the ability to listen and to be able to hear the voice of others, and then to be able to reflect on what did they hear and bringing that back to the classroom in terms of what did you see? What did you feel? What did you hear? I think that provides that opportunity for students not only to just read, but to actually be in a space, you know, where they can, can hear from others and actually experience what's outside of the classroom. So that's what I've done in the past and it's been powerful. I know we're in the midst of a pandemic and we can't go into various spaces, but you can be creative with that and do that via Zoom some kind of way, or just to have students just kind of do a walk through a community and what do they, what are they seeing? What are they experiencing? And then have them reflect on that. Especially with you being in Chicago, Nate. You got plenty of neighborhoods to go to. I also think that uh, a pedagogy of lament happens when we're aware of and allow for it as it occurs right in front of us. I remember in one of my classes, one of our male students actually burst into tears, which shocked us all because, you know, men are not supposed to cry, right? But his best friend had been killed and he could not contain it right in the middle of that class. And so we stopped class. Nothing else went forward. And in response to what he told us, and we said, can you share what happened? And he did. And all of us stopped and I said, would you as individuals in this class write a note or a letter to him now? And so we stopped and we became very quiet and they wrote. 
and then when they shared with him what they wrote, they wrote themselves about experiences of loss, but also affirmation and support for him. Then after that, we ask the students to talk about what gets them through. And then they began to talk about scriptures that made a difference in their lives during times of loss. When we all ended, everybody walked over to him and embraced him and everybody cried and everybody hugged and everybody nurtured one another. I've seen that student a number of times since then. It's been some years ago. He still remembers that event in class. And for him, I think it gave him some tools about how it is that you engage in lament with someone else or with a group. So it happens in front of us all the time. Do we see it and do we respond? Thank you, that helps a lot, thank you. All right, I have one more question for the group before we close for today. And this goes back to Mary's presentation in which she talked about within church and beyond church. How easy is it really, honestly, for our churches today to move beyond themselves? We know about siloing. <laughs> How easy is it? Does the church really move beyond itself? And uh, if, if it does, how does that happen? If it doesn't, how do we get them to move from within to beyond the church? What's going on? Dr. Wimberley, it occurs to me that so much of this movement is driven by the vision of leadership. Now, COVID has pushed folks out of the church, <laughs> even when they did not want to go or felt like they were not ready to go. But even so, the, the, the action of what ministry looks like outside of the four walls of the church is a perspective of one who has some vision, right? And so that was, that's the first thing I would suggest is that this is so driven by vision. And the, the, the second thing is that the, the church must begin to see itself as being one with the community, not as an entity that needs to provide what the community doesn't have, but one with the community in which the church learns from the community. Sarah said she found God in the prison. <laughs> we tend to think that we are always taking God someplace or that we need to give God to someone. And that is just not the case. I, I, I do believe that during this season, it is an opportunity for the church to learn and to partner with the work of God that is occurring us uh, all over the place and outside of our own walls. So it is, it is certainly my perception that when leadership is open to the various ways that God is making God's self known in the world, we will be, the church will be the richer, the church will be the better because we we have opened our the, the doors of our minds to what God is up to in the world. COVID is helping us. We might not like it, but COVID is helping us. I would agree that, that leadership is, is key and leadership is vital. And vision is a, a great part of that. And for leaders who are not, that they don't see that as part of their vision, I also think they have to be open to other members of their community who have that kind of giftedness and want to be, you know, kind of involved in that kind of, in that kind of ministry. Uh, sometimes I think, you know, even as I see, for instance, you know, some of our students from seminary who who graduate, who have that, who have that passion to do social justice ministry, and then they find themselves in traditional church and get so bogged down in the eternal workings of the church that they can't even get to some of the things that they are 
are passionate about, passionate about. So I also think this COVID-19 is an opportunity because one of the things that leaders have done already is they have started to partner with entities that they had no idea they needed to partner with just in order to do, for instance, like a Sunday morning worship. And so it, I think it's kind of teaching them that, that there is going to be whatever was normal is not going to be normal anymore. And so they have to kind of be open to addressing and looking at, you know, social justice issues. I met with, with a couple of clergy just last night because they are looking to start a new ministry and they, you know, they, they don't want to be quote unquote traditional ministry. They do want to address social justice issues. And I said to them, I said, well, you know, they were wondering, you know, is this, a, is this the time to do this? I said, yes, it's the time to do this. I said, this is a, probably a better time to do this so that, you don't, so that you don't adhere to traditional church models. You have opportunity to create something different and something new to address the issues that you find in your individual communities. Yes, thank you so much. I see that our time is almost up and I know there are some other hands that are up, but hold on to your thoughts send us an email or write a question in and we'll see if we can respond. But to close, I simply want to raise this question for all of us to take with us. Is justice possible? Amidst all that is going on, is justice possible? And alongside that question, what is our role as religious educators in making it possible? Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for sharing panelists. Go in love and peace and safety.